You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, God damn it! Get the point good. And now... Bend over. Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Oh yeah, and I have too much time on my hands. <laughs> or maybe not enough time on my hands. God only knows. Oh Lord, looks like my volumes are good tonight. Woo woo! Woo woo! Let me check real quick. I'm doing do a couple little do me flotchies. Because I don't want to blow your brains out. Totally. Maybe just, okay, maybe just a little bit. Maybe with just because of my Freaky Friday stuff. I don't know. Okay, let me check real quick. Yay! I do like that song. I like uh, Tommy Shaw, though. I had a major palpitation for him back in the day. <laughs> okay, y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocketeer here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 3. Also on the RLM Radio.xyz site, the RLM TuneIn Radio Station, the RLM Internet Radio Station, the RLM Spreaker Channel. Yeah, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. And so that means I can infect you just like I did Flukey. Flukey, I'm so sorry. Well, actually, I'm not sorry, Fluke. <laughs> I am not one bit sorry. I'm just kind of weird like that. So... Okay, over here on Minds, I shared it over on Minds. Y'all, if you're not a member of Minds, come on over. Minds Beta. It is pretty cool. And from what I understand, they've got some kind of thing going on where you can uh, exchange your Minds points for Bitcoin. Hey, that sounds interesting. Um, but yeah, come on over and say, hey, there's several groups that I'm, a few groups that I have stepped away from because it's like, really, you're inundating my little notification box. And I just, wow, I'm just not finding enough in here to make it worthwhile for me to just stick around in this group. So there's a few that I've left, but a few that I've joined. So, and I'm really enjoying, there's a, a natural, natural foods or whatever that, what is the name of that? Let me take a peek. Oh, Natural Cures. There you go. Um, I'm enjoying that page and a couple others. But yeah, there's a couple others that I had to step away from. And yes, Milica, I shared that or, or yeah, forwarded it or whatever, whatever it is you do over on Minds. Uh, political, whoa, stop that, stop that. Political correctness is the weapon designed to silence people whose arguments cannot be refuted. Basically, it's um, in order to be politically correct, someone has to be made uncomfortable by what you say. And if their being uncomfortable trumps your ability to speak your mind, there is something really wrong here and somebody needs to grow a pair. Pull up their big girl panties or their big boy tidy whities Grow up. Learn to deal. And if nothing else, have a little verbal tete-a-tete and then turn and walk away. It's okay. It's okay. It's just the interwebs. And if it's face-to-face, -face, it's okay. Turn around and walk away. That's what you do. So, okay, over here on this effing site, I see the lovely T.D. Sanders is over here, and she's sharing some fun stuff. I also see Grimmy is over here. Thank you, Grimmy, for sharing me. I truly appreciate that, hon. Um, let's see who else is here. Cowboy Tech is also here, and Fraser Flav was on for a while, as well as yours truly. What is this, T.D., that you shared that is just too funny? Daughter to father. Dad? There is something my boyfriend said to me that I didn't understand. He said that I have a beautiful chassis, lovely airbags, and a fantastic bumper. Father's response was, Tell your boyfriend that if he opens your bonnet and tries to check your oil with his dipstick, I'll tighten his nuts so hard <laughs> that his headlights will pop out and he will start leaking from his exhaust pipe. <laughs> That is a good one, T.D. 
I can picture that, too. I have a sick mind, don't you know? Okay, over here on Twitter, thank you ever so much, Barman, for tweeting me out. Barman from Real Liberty Media and from that FN site. Yay! Barman is the bomb. And over on Fakey Book, I don't know that I got anybody playing along over here on Fakey Book, but that's okay. I posted it anyway. I do see Gary L and Pam. You know, I've I don't know if I'm I'm on one of those subliminal Facebook timeout kind of things cuz hardly anybody is seeing anything that I put on there. So, it's not necessarily that I got a fakey book timeout, but I'm definitely not getting fakey book is having fun with people and it's not real funny. But then again, I stop and think, okay, I've been down that road. I have actually tried to uh, manage a uh, social network site and uh, never again, never. That's just, Flasher, I know you keep telling me don't ever say never again, but man, I, I did that once. That, that was enough. <laughs> More than enough. Okay, now over here in the RLM, which is where you need to be. If you're listening in on Spreaker, come on over to the RLM chat. Just go to reallibertymedia.com and uh, click on the chat thing and create a nickname and chitty chat with me in there because I really can't. I, I have trouble keeping track of what I got. And uh, yeah, so I just shut down Twitter. Um, and I think I lost a couple of links that I was hoping to get to, but maybe, maybe they're Maybe they're in here, because I do have the log, and I know the love, I think Kate shared one. Let me look, let me look, I'm scrolling. Yeah, over here on the RLM, which is where you need to be, if you want to give me static. That's what I'm saying. Okay, um, scrolling, 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 and maybe I just lost those links, and I'm just not going to get to play with those, and that's okay as well. BFD, you know, because when I did my reboot, because, yeah, I needed to do a boot and reboot, um, or boot myself in the butt or something, I don't know, whatever, okay, I'm not seeing it, it's not jumping out, telling me hi, so, heck with it, so, over here in the RLM, see you, love you, bye, Motley Alaska, and I see that you quit, hon, you probably have things to do, like, you know, you have a life, all that fun stuff, um, Silver's down to 16-something again. Damn it! I wish they would quit messing with that. I want it to get back to up to at least where I bought it <laughs> a few years ago. Okay, over here in the RLM, Barman is right up top. Hey, Barman, you most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. He's closely followed by Cowboy Tech, who is always hearing pleasant voices. What a wonderful man. You know, whenever somebody says something like that, that is more of a reflection upon themselves than it is on anyone else. That's also a good little tip for you to um, remember whenever someone starts throwing all kind of slurs at you. Because a lot of times slurs are a hell of a lot easier to throw out there than actual irrefutable proof. So... Um, <clears throat> when someone throws slurs at you, remember, that is a reflection of themselves, not you. I can say this because I do it too. And I know that I throw slurs occasionally. And, um, yeah, I recognize that that is a reflection upon me, not necessarily on that person. Even though I may think they're an asshole, and they may really be an asshole. But, me throwing that out there... <sighs> just is a reflection of me, however you wish to look at that. So, Grimner is here. Grimner is the RLM god. He is the one that created the RLM and makes sure that things are running the way they should be. I also see the lovely Moose Girl, and you know what? Moosey and Grimmy are going to be on later on this evening on this Groundhog evening, Groundhog Freaker Friday evening, and they're going to be doing the Freaker Friday thing here in the RLM. Y'all want to stick around for that or come back and check it out. It's cool. I also see the lovely Kate is here. Hi, Kate. How are you doing, sweetheart? How's things down? I see that you uh, are not used to all the sounds and all that fun stuff. Yeah, you moved to the town again, and it's like, whoa, whoa, I'm not used to this shit. I like my nice and quiet. 
I really do. I also see the lovely Beth Z is here. Hey, Beth, how you doing? And looky there, Chalcedony got the O going on, too, instead of Chalcedony. The lovely Chloe is here. We got a double dip in her, as a matter of fact. And Gary L, yay! And Gary L is feeling more human now. Yay for Gary L. I hope Gigi's boo is feeling well as well. I see you're here, Grimmy. Oh, it's like the Who's down in Whoville. We're here. We're here. <laughs> Oh, I'm see I see I'm here as well as I be Don C. Did you get that Equinox, hon? Just curious. Wanting to know how you like it. I also see Java 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 Doctor 2 is here. Hey Java and looky there JJ's is also in the house. That Scottish feller that's always got a breeze blowing up his skirt. <laughs> oh, that's a kilt. It, that, that's different. Okay. Um Juana Taco is here. Welcome to the Feminist Fight Club. I see this in the back. Oh, good God. Wow, girly. Whew, that's attractive. Mm, not. Okay, back to saying hi. <laughs> Squirrel. Juana Taco and Mr. Bra, Meister Bra. Hey, dude, be back in a bit, cowboy. Will you be safe, sweetheart? He who smiles the most wins. And you know why that is? Because either you're smiling because you're happy or you're smiling and making someone else go, what are they up to? Which means that you win. <laughs> it's a bonus round. Um, I also see Mr. Asmodeus is in the house, or logged in at least. Hey, Mr. Asmodeus. And looky there, P. Bunyan is here as well. And the lovely rain. Hi, Rain. And RLM Fluke. Hi, Flukey. She's the Vanna White of the RLM channel. And I know Fluke is a bot, but I still think Fluke is a female bot. She bot, he bot, a wee bot. Well, Barman is the he bot, and, and RLM Fluke is the she bot. And if those two ever get together, <laughs> they'd be bottons all over the place. Um, I see Rob Works is here. Hey, Rob. Welcome back, hon. You were away for a few days. Did you fire up the bubbler and I just missed it? It would be very nice if you did. Trust no one is here. And trust no one is having lots of fun chitty chatting. Um, what was that? Oh, okay. Cool. I'm just, I'm kept trying to, yeah. Okay. What? For old people. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Florida is full of. Oh, well. <laughs> I've never been to Florida. I really can't say. <sighs> okay, where was I? Woodman! Oh, see, we got a double dip in there, too. Mr. Bra, Meister Bra, and Woodman. How are you guys doing? I also see, yeah, that's the, the twin and the evil twin. For those of you that don't know. <laughs> Could be fun. Hey, Beetle. I see you're logged in. Um, I also see Colfax 101, as well as Dakota, and Dimma, and the frumpy one, the frumpy one. Frumpy, I didn't have time to tell you earlier today, but I really like that pit bull pick. That was really cool, and that, 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 I just, I see her as a female. I see that doggy as a female, and not wanting to leave unless the little chihuahua went with her, and I just, that's just too cool. See, and people say, oh, animals don't have feelings. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yes, they do. Okay, Kozu is in the house. Hey, Kozu, and looky there, Poxified and Pom -pom, Pom Sauce are both logged in, but they are away right now. The cuddly one, Teddy, is here, and Vinny Tomcat. Vinny, 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 Vinny. You sweetheart. Vinny is just, Vinny likes to have people see Vinny. <laughs> Bless his heart. He's everywhere. I just, please do not give me the mental image that, um, you know, you're in tights, honey, because, wow, Vinny in tights. No, that's just scary. <laughs> 
Even if they're orange. No, ooh, that would be even worse. Okay. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the Phantom. So that's everybody over here in the RLM. And I still got it done before 20 minutes. <laughs> See, whenever you tune in, it takes me at least, well, close to 20 minutes just to say, yeah. Um, oh, Grimmy said it's for that very reason that he set Barman and Fluke to ignore each other. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the uh, what cybernetic pitter patter sounds like, Grimmy. Maybe you want to take that ig ignore away for a while, just so we can see. I'll sit back with my popcorn, <laughs> an adult beverage, and just go look at all those little bots running around. They're so cute. They're so cute. Okay, let's see, Mister Bond. Hello, Mr. Bond. Mm -hmm. Over on Mines, by the way. Okay. Mm oh, thank you. Let's see. I'm going to go to my pocket list right away because, yeah. Mm. Oh, and there's, yes, this right here. The lovely Kate shared this earlier today, and I read it, you know, which probably means I'm not going to read it tonight. Because <laughs> if I actually read it... You know, before I get on, the, it's like, mm, it's just no fun anymore reading it live because I already know the punchline or how it ends. So, yes, someone's taking my name in vain. Um, oh, isn't, isn't that adorable, Chloe? And they do, they look alike. It's like me and Minnie me <laughs> They're just so darn cute. Ha, oh, puppies. Okay. Um, in any case, this was a column that uh, my hatred of Donald Trump has been bottomless. And uh, you know what? I mean, and I understand. I truly do understand how she feels because that's the way I felt about Dangleberry. It was like, oh, I totally despise this guy. And then I finally decided why. Why am I wasting so much of my energy and my time despising this guy? And so I kind of sort of started, what? Oh, I wasn't around for the bot wars? Oh, you wouldn't say... <laughs> Ah, bot wars. Hmm, that would be interesting. Okay, well, I guess it is a good thing that they're on ignore. Because, you know, looking at the flip side of it, Grim, if they ever got into a fight, you know, and then decided to not be on speaking terms and wouldn't speak to any of the rest of us either, that would not be a good thing. So, okay, you know best, Grimmy, because you are the RLM god. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, now back to this. Oh, I would too, Chloe. I would too. They're such cute little puppies. Okay, back to this article. The gal that has the bottomless pit of of hatred for Trumples. I really felt that way for a while. And, you know, mom, kept, mom and I would talk, and she and I, neither one of us, really cared for uh, Dangleberry. And, um, and by the way... If I didn't care, I wouldn't come up with a nickname for you, just saying. You know, it's pretty much the way our family works. If we didn't care, we wouldn't bother with a nickname. We would use your full name every time we referred to you or spoke to you. Middle name and everything. You know, that's the whole mom thing. So, yeah. In any case, the more I got to thinking about it, the more I got to talking to my mom about it, it really got to the point where I felt sorry for him. And I still do. I pity Dangleberry. Number one, because he has to live with Michelle, although I don't know that he necessarily has to. Divorce is a hell of a lot cheaper than murder, hun. Um, <laughs> just putting that out there. But, um, yeah. <sighs> I just, I don't care for politicians, period. But I also, you know, the ones, the higher up they get, the sadder I feel for them because, wow, what all did they have to give up? And, you know, uh, a lot of people think, oh, but look at them. They're living high on the hog. They're doing this. They're doing that. But they're also having to look over their shoulder constantly. And the higher up you get, the less uh, privacy you have. And, oh, my God, having to ride around in a tank 
because you never know who might be gunning for you. Is that a way to live? No, no. They may want to have all that power, but oh, the price they pay, which is, um, I watched uh, the first of the new series of the Shannara Chronicles on Netflix last night, and uh, they had spoken about how all magic has a price to be paid. And yeah, yeah, there's a price to be paid for all of that power. Are you willing to pay it? I'm not. I'm willing to pay whatever price I have to pay for the control and power over me, but not over anybody else. Sorry, love you, but I don't want to have that kind of shit. So, yeah, I can understand why she is so angry. Because within a year of Dangleberry getting POTUS or being named POTUS, I was still pretty angry and pretty much full of despising him and and mm. but yeah once I kind of sort of stopped and thought about it and thought wow would I want that job seriously all the shit they have to put up with honey stop wasting all your energy on that focus on what you can fix Focus on what's going on around you. Learn to appreciate everyone around you, even the ones that you don't get along with because they show you your limits, if nothing else. They show you where you won't go. They show you how you won't behave. So, you know, they're a negative lesson. And so focus on that stuff and pay him no heed. You know, he's just some doofus with funky ass hair and really bad orange tan or at least he had a really bad orange tan and yeah he's got a suck job he's he's the sacrificial lamb he's the goat you know um the one that they say the buck stops here well you know that's where the fuck stops too because yeah ultimately sure they may get to wallow around in some fun stuff but the price they pay I would not pay it. So, honey, don't be so mad at him. Feel sorry for him, if nothing else. Because, yeah. He, he, and pity. Oh, there's a lot of people that don't like being pitied. A lot of people. And usually those are the ones that really deserve the pity. So, okay. Um, Where do I want to go? Um, Oh, FBI warns Republican memo could undermine faith in massive unaccountable government secret agencies no really this is from the onion and you know it really is sad that the onion is <laughs> more truthful than the corporate lame ass propaganda system okay so <clears throat> it's under their politics session which Polly is many ticks is bloodsuckers so yeah no Chloe no one twisted his arm to get there but you know what that's one of those things where um, be careful what you wish for you just might get it and there's always a lot more than just the pretty package that you initially see you know and part of that I know part of that because when I was on city council I thought oh I'm gonna get on city council I'm gonna straighten this shit out by God we ain't gonna have no more three to a pickup and two of them leaning on shovels while one of them's actually doing the work and yada yada blada blada yeah you find out just how impotent you are even in small scale so, yeah, it may look fun, it may look glamorous, it ain't. It's a bunch of shit. And I know, because my phone rang off the wall for four years, <laughs> and I was just on city council. And so, you know, if you take that and you extrapolate it out to being the big guy for the most powerful nation in the universe or at least on this little bit of dirt floating around in whatever yeah I wouldn't want it and I do pity him I do partly because it's like dude seriously he fell for that one there's a sucker born every minute and you went 
I'm going to fix it. <laughs> no, you're not. They ain't going to let you. <laughs> but you just go right ahead and think you are, hun. None of them can. None of them. Okay, so back to this um, onion article. Stressing that such an action would be highly reckless, FBI Director Christopher Wray warned Thursday that releasing the Noons memo could potentially undermine faith in the massive, unaccountable government secret agencies of the United States. Oh, honey, you know what? Don't worry about that, because probably about 70% of the population doesn't know about them. So how are they going to have faith in something they don't know about? Moving along. Making this memo public will almost certainly impede our ability to conduct clandestine activities operating outside any legal or judicial system on an international scale, said Ray, noting that it was essential that mutual trust exist between the American people and the vast mysterious cabal given free reign to use any tactics necessary to conduct surveillance on U.S. citizens or subvert religious and political groups. Funny how a fake news site, a satirical site, nails it. Talk about being the jester in the throne room. If we take away the people's faith in this shadowy monolith, exempt from any consequences, all that's left is an extensive network of rogue, unelected intelligence officers carrying out extrajudicial missions for a variety of subjective and occasionally personal reasons. At press time, Ray confirmed the massive, unaccountable government secret agencies were unaware of any wrongdoing for violating constitutional rights. Well, you know... <clears throat> I'm sorry, <laughs> but we already know, or at least some of us do. Uh, gotta love the onion, because you peel back the layers and it just brings tears to your eyes. <sighs> okay, I'm going to put this over on mines real quick. Oops. Stutter fingers are us. <laughs> okay. You uh, now you know. Oh, hey. Oh. <laughs> wow, TD. Some of the things you share, honey. That's like, ooh. I know people that have bottles for that. Mm. <laughs> she shared a meme over here on uh, F and site that's like, ooh. Ooh. Okay, I gotta find me a little emoticon. Hmm. Yeah, we'll do that one. Okay. Do I need to put it? I'll put it over here again, too. Just because it was on here earlier today. Um. $45,000 Tesla roof. Oh. Ooh, I saw that one. Yeah, I saw that Tesla roof, trust no one. The The one that's each shingle is a solar, uh, well, they're not really shingles, but they're solar panels, basically, little little solar panels. That did look really cool. Yes, it is pricey, but if you can be self-sufficient, or pretty much self-sufficient, that would be just freaking awesome. Okay, I'm going to put this over here on Fakie Book 2 just because I'm going to see, I want to see how much of my stuff is getting seen. Probably not a whole hell of a lot. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. 
And I think I'll do an emoticon on that one too. Yeah. We'd do that one. So, um, yeah. Now, did I save? I think I tried to. I think I tried to save. I, I kept clicking on the links that Gary Yell was sharing. And, um, you know, with the, the unredacted. And, yeah. It kept trying to download the PDF. So I'm probably going to have to look over on Fakiebook and see if I can get that. In any case, moving along. Um, do I want to go to Zero Hedge or do I want to... Do I want to... How about... Um, yeah. I'll go to this one. This is one that Ethan Indigo Smith posted over on wakeupworld.com and he also posted it over on mines and I just <clears throat> I like the headline so I thought throw it in the pocket um, oligarchical say that three times fast collectivism the institutional ism that threatens our very biology now when he shared that over on mines I kind of sort of said you know I think isms are the most subtly dangerous or ism is the most subtly dangerous um, suffix that we can ever add to anything because it it changes what might be virtuous into something that is an ugly kind of group think that eventually starts using force because well you know it's such a wonderful idea we're going to force you at gunpoint to follow it yeah in any case to this article there will be no curiosity no enjoyment of the process of life all competing pleasures will be destroyed but always there will be the intoxication of power constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler always at every moment there will be the thrill of victory the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless if you want a picture of the future imagine a boot stamping on the human face forever that's from 1984 by George Orwell Capitalism, communism, socialism, fascism, imperialism, corporatism, authoritarianism, monarchism, postmodern colonialism, and whatever form of governmentism you can imagine all eventually degrade over time to become oligarchical collectivism, the kind of ism that benefits the powerful few at the expense of the powerless many. The isms of all isms, oligarchical collectivism, is the result of contrasting opposition within a society. That is to say, the creating and countering of perceived threats to the society. The consolidation, or to consolidate their power, threats are both created and solved by those in power in a way that encourages the society to gradually relinquish its sovereignty and freedom to the state that protects it. it or, and yet the system designed to counter perceived threats are as extreme as the threats themselves and as extreme as the society and its individuals can be conditioned to tolerate. Government and corporate institutions in our society are always, it seems, seeking to push more and more tolerations. Not tolerance for differences between us, but toleration of wrongdoing. Over time, we have come to tolerate war, government corruption, corporate personhood, surveillance of our private lives, and environmental degradation, 
all as normal parts of the industrialized society. And as industrialization proceeds, unrestrained by the individual liberties we continue to give up by not exercising in the name of security and nationalism, those institutions eventually harden into oligarchical collectivism. Yeah, that wonderful group think stuff. If you have socialism without capitalism, it becomes communism. If you have capitalism without socialism, it becomes fascism. And ultimately, all isms become oligarchical collectivism. No matter its beginning form, individual liberty is eliminated as power and influence is put in the hands of megalithic institutions, be they corporate, government, or otherwise, that are controlled by a very few, and in some way or another, depending on the times, technology, and tolerations of the day, we end up immersed in oligarchical collectivism, where the governed group mind is steered toward willingly sacrificing individual sovereignty to uphold and protect the ism from falsely perceived threats. So how is that? How is that done? It's called divide and conquer. That's why there's two parties and only two. And they're controlled by the same people at the very top. The Council of For for Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the United Nations, and the Trilateral Commission. These are the people who control your world by making global policies you never vote on and who both parties serve. But divide and conquer can only work if people aren't aware of the falsely created divisions. If you know about it, it don't work no more. Oligarchical collectivism, the phrase oligarchical collectivism is from George Orwell's 1984 and is so descriptive that it accurately summarizes every government in 1948 when it was first published and every government since. It defines a society in which institutions such as government, media, and corporate interests, which are controlled by a handful of individuals, link together, collaborating to direct, regulate, and benefit from the activities of the many. Governments, whatever their label and whatever their ism, are all about control. Governments all begin with controlling the mind, influencing and shaping society through propaganda and policy. And as government structures become more heavily cemented, their control of the group mind also becomes more cemented. And eventually these institutions, like all institutions, strive to expand and extend their power and influence. The major point of expansion becomes the government system itself. Soon enough, the government no longer serves the isms it initially represented. It serves its own existence at any cost. It's called job security, peeps. They put the boogeyman out there so that you will come running to them to protect you. That's called job security. From there, the extent to which collectivism takes precedence over individual rights is determined only by how much is tolerated and even embraced by the people. See, the government doesn't even really have to do a whole hell of a lot because they've got us all trained and we're trained so well. And I say us as a collective. I don't say individuals because there's an awful lot of individuals that I know that are not quite trained so well. But 
you know, when you get the group to move as a group, when you have one that goes against the grain, the group will move them. That's all part of this. So, with the global governments, mass media, and world's most powerful capitalist ventures linked together, collaborating with a common purpose to control and benefit from the mass mind, the extent of collectivism uh, or collectivist thinking at play today is unprecedented and dangerous. But it did not come without a warning from the inside. A power has risen up in the government greater than the people themselves, consisting of many and various and powerful interests combined into one mass and held together by the cohesive power of the based surplus in the banks. That's from John C. Calhoun, the seventh president of the United States. Some of the biggest men in the U.S. in the field of commerce and manufacturing are afraid of somebody, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. That was Woodrow Wilson, the 28th President of the United States, from his book, The New Freedom, in 1913. We are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. That was JFK, the 35th President of the United States, from an address to the American Newspaper Publishers Association in 1961. If we dig deep enough, we can easily find legitimate historical evidence of vast criminal conspiracies international in scope and completely feudalistic and fascistic. That is to say, oligarchical. That is what governments do. You may think this sounds paranoid, but it's a simple fact. The United States is a privately owned and operated corporation. A familial corporate oligarchy runs the British Empire. And the Empire of Japan has instilled an accepted level of oligarchical slavery that is perhaps unequaled in history. And, colluding behind the scenes of power, their beneficiaries conspire for the benefit of a network of cartels and corporations across the earth while hiding behind their own carefully crafted legal protections and illusions of institutional personhood. The contemporary crap creek of mainstream media, or as Grimming says it, corporate lame-ass propaganda system, in the United States would have us all believe that oligarchies only exist in Russia and Eastern, Europe, Eastern European Old World nations. And if you've never heard of Eastern establishment families, or maybe have you had your head under a heavy rock since birth? You might believe this to be so. However, this media induced, this is a media induced falsehood. Although it claims to be a democratic republic, the United States is itself oligarchical, 
a structured network of power and influence that includes government and major media institutions, the perfect partnership for effective propaganda. And this is no wild conspiracy theory. According to a study entitled Testing Theories of American Politics, Elites, Interest Groups, and Average Citizens, published by political scientists from Princeton and Northwestern Universities in 2014, the United States is an oligarchy. According to my own studies, however, the USA is more specifically a collectivist oligarchy a series of interlinked oligarchies, including finance, corporate, government, and religious bodies, collaborating and networking together in a fashion that promotes the rights of institutions and crushes the rights of individuals, directing power up and away from the individual toward those who quietly pull the strings all the while conning the masses into believing it is in their own best interest. When you think about a few controlling the many, an absolute prerequisite to that is to centralize decision-making, centralized power. Because the more points of decision-making there are, the less control any few at the center are going to have over those decisions. What we've seen throughout history, and I would strongly contend that there has been a force and still is behind this um, throughout history, if you look at the world or at the word globalization, that is just a word to describe this process of incessant centralization of control and power. That was David Icke. With institutional control so deeply embedded in our history and so widely promoted in our media, individuals around the world identify with institutions, national identity and the law of the collective over themselves their own identity and their inherent rights under natural law. This mindset is almost apparent with or is most apparent within the most stringent oligarchical structures to the point that individually questioning conformity to the most immoral status quo of those institutions is considered outrageous and offensive to the collectivist mind. And, as such collectivist thinking overtakes moral and personal judgment, a slavery mentality is formed with, which perpetuates the diminishing of human consciousness and allows for further progress in the name of collective, such as increased environmental destruction, perpetual wars, a lifetime of economic slavery, and the continued fukushimization of the Pacific and beyond, none of which actually benefits the collective, only the beneficiaries at the top of the heap. Biological co oligarchical collectivism is in its current form um, of today and it has become more of a threat to our individual freedom. It is, with our collective consent, degrading our very biology. George Orwell coined the term oligarchical collectivism as he did many others in his immortal political fiction 1984. This fictional world was war world under constant surveillance where institutionalized violence and terrorism prevailed. One thing Orwell did not expunge on this book, however, is the eventual buildup of control to a level that assumes authority of our very biology. Biological, oligarchical, collectivism, which is what we have today 
basically what that means is you do not have a choice in medical treatment. You, the only choice you have is to go with what they say. FDA, Health and Human Resources, uh, EPA, AMA, NIH. Shall I go on? Anything that truly does help you, you're not allowed those. Only what they say. That is a biological, oligarchical collectivism. And you know what? They have the people working for them. What? You're not going to do chemotherapy? What? You're not going to take that prescription medication? What? You're a danger to society. Yeah, that is a danger to their society. So biological oligarchical collectivism began with the tainting of our natural resources, like the very essential air and water, and the control of these essential resources with increasing ferociousness the resources that were once free for all, a natural right, are being bought up in an oligarchical free-for-all and sold back to us for corporate profit. A prime example is the Nestle Corporation being allowed and protected by government to bottle and sell back to Californians what little drinking water they have in reserve. But in each step in the wrong direction, the persistent infesting nature of oligarchy compels further misdirection to the point that today governments have initiated policies of total biological control. Current policies of the oligarchy include deliberately altering the genetic biology of our food supply engineering our planet's climate and atmosphere, suppressing natural and ancient medicinal remedies, such as cannabis among many, and mandating profitable yet dangerous pharmaceutical treatments in their place. In effect, the powers of our society have assumed the right to control our bodies. The story of the American Indian corn illustrates the psychology of control and the total biological oligarchical collectivism damn, it's getting harder to say, <clears throat> of the 21st century. Corn is among the most sacred crops to American indigenous peoples. Over time, the people of the Americas saw the families killed, their rights taken, their land stolen and settled, their children taken for re-education and their cultural system or their culture systematically eliminated amounting to a total subversion of their natural individual and collective rights in every way imaginable once the sacred plant the corn has been stolen the genetic modification of plants has unleashed unnatural biological transformations into the natural world stealing the very essence of the corn and influencing the very genetic makeup of all life that interacts with it. Yes, that does go down the food chain. You don't hear about it here in USA, but other countries know they've done the research. Even Monsatan new and yet they framed the results in such a manner that it didn't sound bad at all it was actually beneficial for the collective right increased government secrecy and lack of transp transparency with as much as 90 percent of the government activity now classified Punitive systems that no one hand punishes or, okay, punitive systems on, oh, excuse me, on one hand, punishes people for the possession and ingestion of natural substances 
such as cannabis, psilocybin, and peyote, Schedule 1 controlled substances, um, also include raw milk in there while you're at it, while simultaneously forcing the, ingest, the ingestion of pharmaceutical drugs through various law enforcement and psychiatric institutions. Mandatory vaccinations with the burden of risk forced on the victims of vaccine damage, not the vaccine maker who makes billions of dollars in profits, or the governments that enforce and promote their uptake, or the governmental agencies that happen to own patents on many, many, many vaccines. Specific medical treatments such as chemotherapy, which comes with a 2.1% survival rate, are enforced by the state, while children are taken into custody of the governmental protection agencies when such treatments are refused by their parents. Non-disclosure of genetically modified foods and GM ingredients, removing our right to know and decide what we eat, while downplaying the known negative effects of toxic GM agriculture and the damage to human health caused by GMO consumption, including digestive diseases and cancer. Governments exerting its power to declare war on contrived and covert bases, sending from the safety of their own offices people on both sides of the conflict to their deaths, and thereby fueling a trillion dollar war industry on which the U.S. is now economically reliant. The investment of public money into nuclear energy systems, which by design cause widespread environmental contamination and, ding, 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 induce cancer. The active suppression of information relating to the biological threat we face from the failing nuclear industry, including but not limited to Fukushima. The biased promotion of toxic and unnecessary oil and plastics industry. The active suppression of renewable and non-polluting energy and resource systems, such as hemp, in favor of the above-mentioned nuclear and oil-based systems. The displacement of indigenous cultures and communities from their natural lands. The assumption of government ownership and control of all land and resources within imperially defined territories. The ongoing use of covert geoengineering practices, deliberately modifying atmospheric and oceanic conditions without public disclosure or consent. The promotion of natural gas extraction from hydraulic fracking or fracturing or fracking, which devastates underground ecosystems and waterways, creating radioactive waste that causes cancer and environmental devastation, all for corporate profit. The institutionalization of unsustainable levels of deforestation and mining. The rise of the police state, in which the authorita of police no longer protects, but regulates people. Why? Because they are in law enforcement, not peace keeping or even policing. It is law enforcement and in which it is considered terrorism to question or protest the rule of government. And the list goes on and on and on. The societal modifications that insert oligarchical collectivism work via gradual processes and trends that frogs in the saucepan and the water is gradually getting heated up. Is it starting to feel warm in here? If we were to institute the encroaching feudal system of today, decades ago, people would have been furious. But we slid here nice and easy over time. Just as the public gets 
used to one encroachment on our rights, another more offensive trend comes and takes its place at the front of our collective focus. For the average person, it's all too much to comprehend, much less contest. As a result, the oligarchical collectivism is now so commonplace, so much at the core of the isms of our day, that most people simply shrug off the corrupted feudalism of the, that governs their lives as normal. It's just how it is. It is what it is. Only politics or human nature. However, the total biological oligarchical collectivism of today, of a new technological capacity, presuming to control our access to food, water, resources, weapons, medicine, and even thought. Those in power have the means to wipe us out entirely. And thus, now is the time to either speak up or roll over. So, Ethan Indigo Smith has a book, Complete Patriot's Guide, and it is an insightful exploration of history, philosophy, and contemporary politics of today's heavily institutionalized society. Y'all might want to uh, go check him out um, over on Minds. That's where I got this link. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and share this. That was a rather long one, but wowzer, wowzer, wowzer. He hit the nail on the head. He really did. Um, let's see. What are we doing here? Hey, Beetle. Um, quote. Oh, thank you, Beth. Americans must outgrow the unbecoming arrogance that leads us to assert that America somehow owns a monopoly on goodness and truth a belief that leads some to view the world as but a stage on which to play out the great historical drama, the United States of America versus the powers of evil. Oh, that's a good one, Kate. That's a, actually, that's an excellent one. Thank you for that. That was from Faisal Abdul Rauf. Is that how you pronounce that? Excellent. Excellent. I see Katie Troxel is over here on this F and side. Hey, Katie. Okay. Wow, that took up that took up a lot of time. But sometimes you need to just have someone just smack you upside the head and say, "Seriously, this is how it is," and uh, they're steering us right over the cliff. I do think that they're going to try and keep enough of us around to, you know, do the menial jobs. Because, well, you know, like Prince Charles, he can't put his own damn toothpaste on a toothbrush. Bless his heart. Someone needs to show that sorry ass how to do that. <sighs> of course, there's a lot of things that... Okay. Mm. Um, oh, <laughs> I see you over here on Mines, Cowboy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back to my pocket because that was a wonderful read, a very informative read. But now let's get to something that's just a little bit, um, a little bit more uplifting. You know, we want to have um, something a little bit more positive, don't you think? So how about we try this one? This is from CollectiveEvolution.com. It's from March of 2014. Um, guiding your consciousness, breaking free of negative thought and emotional patterns. And I think this is really, uh, you know, just by going by the, the headline, I think this is a good little thing to have after that last little bit, because that last little bit, not little bit, big, big dump of wow um, that I laid on you. Um yeah. Yeah. While that the temperature got turned up, there were some that were 
yelling, the sky is falling, and the sky is falling because you go out there and you look at the tic-tac-toe grid and you see how hazy the whole sky gets. Yeah, it's not pretty, and that's getting in our groundwater. It's getting in our soil, which means you need to grow hemp because hemp is very good at cleaning that kind of nonsense out of the soil. It really is. It's also very good, apparently, at... Um, cleaning radioactive material. It takes a little bit while, but it will, it's supposed to be very good at cleaning radioactive material out of the soil as well. So, grow hemp. In any case, how do you get past that negative thought and emotion patterns? Well, when we get lost in our thoughts and emotions on the past and future, we often forget the amazing nature of the present moment. A perpetual clean slate to be perceived in whatever way our minds choose. When our minds latch on to a specific feeling or emotion, we often cannot break ourselves free of it. Instead, we spin our wheels over and over again, embedding the idea deeper within our consciousness. However, there are tools that we can use to help us detach from those negative thoughts and experiences. So here we go. Here's some tools that maybe will help us detach from this oligarchical collectivism that we're in right now. Because really, <laughs> if you don't recognize it, it's there. So, take a moment, if you can, and get back to nature. The beauty of it the beauty of it aside, nature itself is a form of healing center. Find a beautiful spot away from being disturbed by other people. Then close your eyes, sit, and focus on your breathing. Then meditate on the following. You are not your emotions. So when you have a negative thought, try to change your language from I am sad or depressed or whatever to I notice that there is sadness or depression in my thoughts, which, hey, that way you're not saying I am. I notice that there is. I am means you're owning it. Noticing that there is is saying that this is something that it is a feeling that I've got going on around me. Not that I am. Simply by changing the language of your speech and thoughts, disidentifying yourself from your emotions and thoughts, your consciousness will begin to shift away from them. Then you might begin to ask the question, Who is this me that is observing this emotion? And what am I supposed to learn through this part of my experience? And you know, that's, I think, where, where the whole, when my mom told me, if you're really, really upset about something, just call, stop and count to 10. And that really, I mean, I, a lot of times I don't get to 10 anymore because, and that was for me going through a lot of, especially with my alone time and getting to know who I am. I still don't know me, but... I'm kind of fun to be around, <laughs> I think. Um, but, you know, when you take some time, when you stop yourself and you go, okay, what is it about this that is either making me feel pissed or feel sad or feel happy or whatever and really start dissecting it? It really does kind of distance that emotion from you. And and if it's a negative emotion, it's not a bad thing to distance yourself from it and be able to kind of dissect it a little bit. If it's a positive emotion, you still want to step back a little bit, see what it, what it is about it that is making you feel happy or uh, feel positive or energetic. And then once you realize what it is that is giving you that feeling, then you want to go and find more of that. <laughs> You don't want to go find, you want to learn to avoid what gives you that sad feeling or gives you that depressed aura or whatever. You want to stay away from those things or you want to fix them if you can, but you want to find what it is that gives you that, those happy thoughts and uh, you want to collect those up and you want to find more of those. 
even if it's just because you're going out and doing things that make you feel better. And if it's doing something for someone else, whether they appreciate it or not, I tell you what, it makes me feel better when I do that. Whether they appreciate it or not, because at least I know I did something and I did it to the best of my abilities at that time. So I accomplished something. That gives me a feel good. Now, you can choose one thing that appears to happen randomly that when it does, it makes you smile or you appreciate in some way. Didn't I just say that? I think I did. For example, I love it when a leaf falls from a tree and spins toward the ground like a pinwheel in front of me as I walk, which that is kind of fun to see. Um, or watching a butterfly with its wings just gradually doing its thing while it's getting some nectar out of a flower. That's way cool to watch too. Then you set the intention that whenever that happens, that is the universe smiling at me and telling me how amazing that moment truly is and that it is conspiring to love you. Hey, I like that. As you practice this, you will notice a transition from intending it to naturally be filled with the awe and joy of life. When this transition happens, choose another seemingly random event and add to your conscious toolbox, then another and then another until the moments that appear insignificant become significantly profound in beauty because so frequent that they approach every cover or they approach covering your entire interaction with your waking life. If this eventually happens, then you will know that moment as nirvana, which I'm not there yet. <laughs> I will admit that. So just as we are academically discovering with brains, consciousness is highly plastic meaning it shifts and changes with every part of your experience that comes into its awareness. So it's incredibly critical to nurture the consciousness that you want to be your experience. This includes the music you choose to listen to, the art that you choose to observe or hang on the wall, the movies that you choose to watch, the type of venues that you choose to spend time in, the people that you choose to be around, the food that you choose to eat, the words that you choose to speak, and finally, the thoughts that you choose to think. So pick a couple of these parts of experience that you choose to shift towards the consciousness that you want to experience. Detach from the ones that bring you pain or sadness and fill in their stead or instead the ones that create, remind, and nurture what you want to experience. Now, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that last little bit there. I do think you need to detach from the ones that bring sadness or pain, but you want to do that after you observe them and you, you understand why you are feeling those emotions. Because maybe just maybe if you look at it from us, you know, and that's part of that detaching from it, you step away from a little bit and then step over to the side and maybe you'll see it from a different perspective and maybe it won't be quite so painful. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't be quite so sad and then maybe it will, but either way you can learn from it and you will realize that, okay, I've looked at this from multiple angles and this is not a happy thought. And so learn from that. I don't think you want to completely, you know, like, Oh, my life is always beautiful. No, it's not, but it is always a learning experience. So, this author goes on to say, for example, I used to watch films that induced fear in their audience. When I wanted to remove fear from my experience, I quit watching any movie that promoted it and replaced it with forward-looking, positive life message films. The art I buy or create are visual reminders of what I want in life. 
and as you shift what your consciousness experiences through what you hear, say, touch, see, smell, and taste, you are creating a powerful intention to only experience those things in your own perception of the world. The universe responds directly to the strength and conviction of your conscious intention. Set the intention to heal and you will be healed. Set the intention to love and you will be loved. The more we work to change the things we interact with externally in our life experience, the easier it becomes to work to change ourselves internally. Life is truly beautiful and amazing if you work towards choosing it to be that way. And you know what? Sometimes life is ugly. Thank you, Robert Sindelar, um, for writing this. I don't agree with a lot, uh, not a lot of it. There's a few things I don't agree with, but mm -hmm. yes, you do have total control over how you perceive things. And, you know, it's like a forest fire is bad. You know, for all of the critters that live in the forest, for those that might get hurt by the forest fire, for the trees, if for no other reason, because it's burning out trees. And yet, it puts nutrients in the soil. And then there's regrowth. So... It's not that you want to ignore the bad things. It's I think you want to acknowledge those things that you view as negative or you view as bad. And you want to build upon that and make something positive grow from it. Sometimes you can't do it. Sometimes there's just no way of making a positive out of a negative. And that's when you have to learn to pick your battles and step away. Maybe somewhere down the road you'll be able to actually deal with it again. But if you can't at this time, put it down and step away. Hmm. Also, do not talk negative yet, negatively to yourself. That's one thing that, wow. I see you, Rob Works. Uh-oh, Grimmy's Grimmy's got his feels going on. What's going on with your feels? But my feels. See, and that's... Okay, cowboy, I'm looking at this right now. Um, I don't believe I have ever lied to the American people. You know what? She probably doesn't believe she has. She probably thinks that what she told us was the truth. It was the truth to her. She repeated it often enough. It's you, That's how powerful your mind is. She can tell some whoppers. And a lot of people call her out on her whoppers. But I tell you what. If she doesn't think she's lying. Then there ain't nothing you can say to her. That will make her think she's lying. There just ain't. Hmm. Okay, what's the very smart groundhog? Yeah, that groundhog. I predict four more years of centrally planned authoritarianism. Oh, there's another ism. This will be followed by more centrally planned authoritarianism, regardless of who wins the next selection. That needs to be selection, whoever made that meme. But other than that, I agree with it. Poxitani Phil, for once, see, this is what happens when you don't drag him out when he's taking a nap. He's cranky when you take him out when he's taking a nap. I mean, don't be pissing him off. Because, yeah, now we got six more weeks of winter. Fuggers, let him sleep, damn it. He intentionally did not set the alarm. Leave him alone. Okay. That's a good one, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, Rob Works, for firing up the bubbler. I truly appreciate that. Okay, I think it's time to see what those crazy guys over on the pig have to say. What happened this date in history? Friday, February the 2nd. You know it's 0202201818. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't I don't know why I said that, but yeah. Oh, what's your pick of the day, piggy guys? Dream catcher, dream ca Oh. <laughs> okay. Let's piss some people off here. Or maybe I'll get some chuckles. Quick, say something smart. You just did, cowboy. <laughs> I like that dream catcher. I'm going to have to put that over here on, on the effing side as well. Just because. Funny. Funny, funny, funny. Those piggy guys, they're just so darn silly. Okay. I have a dream. You know, there's an awful lot of us that have dreams. Unfortunately, a lot of the dreams nowadays seem to, uh, well... There, there seems to be an awful lot of nightmares going on too, which those are a dream j as well. Just, just saying. So, okay, piggy guys. Back to the pig. So, word of the day, Grammys. What? Just another self-righteous smug fest of genetically defective malignant narcissists from Commiewood. Guys, you need to update your word of the day, unless you really like that word of the day. Um, in their quotable quotes, never under any circumstances take a sleeping pill and a laxative on the same night. <laughs> Thank you, Dave Barry. <laughs> That's wise words. Whoo, yeah. From their tasty tidbits. Um... <laughs> Okay, guys, I can't steal that. Damn it. Um, yeah, it's a meme that it's got Michael Moore on it. It says, I'm not fat. I'm just full of shit. Moving along. <laughs> yes, he is. So, um, oh, hey, they have a new race card. A tool of intellectually weak and lazy when they cannot counter a logical argument with factual data. Huh. Imagine that. Okay, this date in history. The 2nd of February, 1653. New Amsterdam, now known as New York City, was incorporated. And yeah, that's when the fight started. This is why we can't have nice things. This date in history, the 2nd of February, 1848. The U.S. gets the first shipload of cargo made in Japan when Chinese immigrants arrive in San Francisco, California. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally. Okay, this date in history, the 2nd of February, 1863. Samuel Longhorn Clemens used a pseudonym for the first time. He is better remembered as Mark Twain. And that's when the giggle fest began. And several people going, did he really say that out loud? Ban those books. He's got Injun Jim and Nigger Joe in there. Ban them books. People, people, people. You don't want to ban those books. You want to keep those books out there for people to see, if for no other reason, to be able to look back and go, look how far we've come. Or, look at this shit. How many years has it been and we're still doing this shit? What the hell? Yeah. Okay, this date in history, the 2nd of February, 1887. The beginning of Groundhog Day in Poxitawney, Pennsylvania. And that's the day that the groundhog first bit someone. Ha ha! This date in history, the 2nd of February, 1905. A Hambo favorite, Ayn Rand, was born. This date in history, the 2nd of February, 1969. Pig's very first Pigster J. Crow, born in Port Chester, New York. Happy birthday, pig. Hey, J. Crow, happy birthday. And finally, this date in history, the 2nd of February, 1973. Holy pyrotechnics. ELP's Keith Emerson injures his hand when a rigged piano prematurely explodes during a concert in San Francisco. ELP's. Hmm, I don't know who that is, unless you mean ELOs. I don't know. Huh. 
Oh, well, the pig has all kinds of other fun stuff over here. And uh, if you want to, come on over to the pig. Say hey to Hambo and Porkus. Tell them Grammy sent you. They'll go, oh, good God, she's still here? Shit. <laughs> yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, what's going on over here on mines? Thank you, Cowboy Tech. Take a peek at the chat again. Uh, oh, 61st first, first anniversary. Congrats to Ron Paul. Wow. Oh, it's there. Wow. 61 years? Holy crap and holy. I... I haven't even been alive that long. <laughs> Dang. Congrats, Ron and Mrs. Paul. I don't... <laughs> Mrs. Pauls. Did she do fish? <laughs> oh, Emerson Lake and Palmer. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know these things. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> See, I am not the all-knowing and all-seeing Grams. That's for the Oz. You know, them jerks that are hiding behind the curtain. That's them. They're the all-knowing and all-seeing. And I'm going to give them something to see. <laughs> the single finger salute is what I'll give them. Hmm. Okay. Moving along. <laughs> Where else shall I go? Um... I have some that are not so fun, and I don't know that I want to go there. Okay. Yes. White Hats Report. Maybe, let me check that one out. I haven't been to the... Hmm. This is whitehatsreport.com. The storm is here. The releases coming over the next few weeks will expose the details of the methods by which the cabal rules the world through the control of money by showing you trading contracts with proceeds as high as 3 trillion to 25 trillion. Wow. Enough to fund every true humanitarian project on Earth in addition to advanced technologies, free energy, the exploration of our universe, housing, hydroelectrical pro projects for underdeveloped countries, turning deserts green, and other infrastructure projects all over the world. I don't know that you want to turn deserts green because it's all part of the ecosystem and we really don't know how all this fun stuff interacts and, you know... I don't know that you really want to mess with that. Maybe you want to stop making more deserts, but is that somewhat egotistical to think that we can do that? Hmm. In any case, instead of mo the money is used to subvert the production of the people to a select few bloodline families. So this is how these people control planet Earth. The signatories to the trading contracts... In the Federal Reserve are Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke, Roger Ferguson, Janet Yellen, Timothy Geithner. U.S. government, it was Dengleberry, Uncle Joe Biden, the creepy uncle that everybody knows, Jack Lew, Paul O'Neill, and Neil Wolin. Trading programs um, were created as a way to raise funds for projects that relate to humanitarian endeavors, i.e., creating, maintaining, and rebuilding infrastructure, assistance with bringing undeveloped countries up to current technologies, rebuilding communities after natural disasters, and they are just a few of the applications. But as with anything to do with the financial world, the rat pack, which is what I prefer to think of them as, uh, the Rat Pack of Bankster Kabbalists have infested it at the highest levels to subvert the program for their own devious plans to control the world. History is p replete with personalities who whose aspirations to run the world are well known. 
Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Adolf Hitler are just a few who come to mind. Then you have the Queen over in England and Dangleberry and now Trumple Stilskin. You know, it's really hard for me to to believe that these people can, especially when I look at them and, and all I see is a giant Oompa Loompa when it comes to Trumples. I, I just can't take him serious. Sorry. Mm. Okay. This is why it's such a... It's, um, let me start this over. Why is it such a stretch to believe that the same lust for power is not present today? Rather than be accomplished by might and power and strength and armies all out in the open... Now it's being done in secret by conning the people of the world, utilizing a usury system of currency control akin to immoral grifters running a game of three-card Monty. Pretty much. The trading programs are initiated, administered, operated, and controlled by the Federal Reserve. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> if you don't know what's coming next, guess what? Now that the information is out in the open about how the Federal Reserve and their bankster brethren are operating a massive con game on the public, we're going to take you to a deeper level. Never seen before and never revealed to the masses on the scale we're about to unveil. Oh, really? But wait, there's more. Flash should really enjoy this one. The elements of the trading program contract our trading program contract are very simple. An investor, an amount, a time period, collateral, earnings, and payout schedule. Sounds pretty standard. The investor puts up the collateral or asset. The Federal Reserve administrates the profit generation mechanism or program trading bank to bank. And the proceeds of the trading profits are split between the parties to the contract and the project fund. There are two parties to the contract, the investor and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, a private corporation. The scam is so simple, although the protocols and mechanisms of the process are sophisticated. So find an investor with vast sums of cash or gold or equivalent asset value Enter into the contractual agreement where their humanitarian objectives are accomplished. Then, when the proceeds are paid from the interbank trading platforms, steal the proceeds and use it for a variety of means, all of which are crimes against humanity and serve to keep us all in chains. Hmm. Over the years, we've discovered the thefts of Falcone, Tropos, Wanta and others accomplished by bribes and payoffs in the millions of dollars, which is pittance compared to trillions. When you generate multiple, or, yeah, multiple trillions with each trading contract, that's a few hundred million paid to the Clintons, Romney, Herzog, um, Gunetti, Biden, and others to keep their mouths shut. When you generate 25, 25,000 trillion or 25 quadrillion, holy crap, you could pay every debt on the books, fund all governments for decades, and of course, trigger a financial reset to enrich every person on the planet. Or you could just remove all of those zeros and just get rid of the financial system. But hey, that takes a drastic mind shift change for that to happen. And I don't see that happening anytime too soon. But no, that's not how it's done when you run the world. You coerce, you bribe, you blackmail, you steal and deceive your way into controlling the planet by controlling the flow of money, creating a process by which you are want the ones at the top of the pyramid. The majority of money generated from these programs is off-balance sheet. 
This means it is not reported. Recall the old joke about two sets of books? Uh-huh. This does go on and on and on, and I'm like, wow. I'm just going to go ahead and share this. And yes, we do need to arrest the Fed, but I do not think that those are necessarily um, the only ones that need to go. Now, off to the side, it does say, the matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, and what do you see? You see businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still part of that system, and that makes them your enemy. You have to understand most of these people are not ready to be unplugged, and many of them are so inured, so helplessly dependent on the system, that they will fight you to protect it. And yes, that is how the system works. It's, you know, it's, it's like they have those signs at uh, national parks to please not feed the animals because you don't want them to become dependent on it. And what do you think they've done with us? They have fed us. A lot of it's bullshit. Now a lot of it's poison. But they have fed us. And we have taken it in. And there are some of us that are stepping away from the feeding trough and saying, no more. I'm full. I don't want any more of your shit. Hey, Bobby, I see you. I see you just turned in. No worries, hon. Guess what? It'll be on the podcast. <laughs> it's all good. Okay, let's see. We'll do this one. And I don't remember where I found that one, so I think I'll just share it over on Minds as well. Probably was on Minds that I found it. Um, dun dun dun. I think I will look under my recommended in my pocket. Oh, hey! Okay. What? Okay, American Thinker. I got to go here just because I like Jordan Peterson. And I listened to um, a discussion with him and, um, oh, the little Jewish guy. <laughs> I can't think of his name now. I can see him. Oh, well, I listened to it earlier today and it was really quite interesting. So this is from AmericanThinker.com. Why the Academic Left... Fears and Loathes, Dr. Jordan Peterson, by John Dunn. Why, thank you, John Dunn. This is from January 26th of this year. So who is this man, this Jordan Peterson, academic clinical psychologist, tenured at the University of Toronto with hundreds of thousands of YouTube followers, who has made a splash recently on a voice of reason? battling the political correctness elites and upsetting the academic um, grandees. Who is this guy? Less than a week ago, we got a stormy weather alert in an article that appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education titled, What's So Dangerous About Jordan Peterson? With the tease, not long ago, he was an obscure psychology professor now he leads a flock of die-hard disciples. One might suppose, considering Mr. Bartlett's choice of words, that Peterson is a Jim Jones-style cult leader. But instinctively, I knew I would, I would like to find out about anybody described as dangerous by a trade paper of American higher education. Mr. Bartlett considers Dr. Peterson a threat because Peterson deviates from the leftist academic canon. 
a conservative, traditionalist, moralist, anti-political correctness, psycho uh, psychologist, academic. Wow, that almost sounds like a massive contradiction in terms. <laughs> he objects to the speech police and the tyranny of the left. Um, that total, or um, he that a totalitarian speech police state is developing in, or in Canada. Okay, that didn't make sense. And by instinct and conviction, he objects strongly to the good speech laws demanding the use of concocted or in, a, in what, whatever, or these stupid ass pronouns that they're coming up with for all these different genders that do not exist and labels preferred by the little darlings of the newly concocted gender identity klaxon cowball and tin drum army. Peterson objects to speech police tactics and he does it eloquently, which yes he does. That's a threat to and dangerous for the academic poobahs who live and breathe censorship and intellectual tyranny. Bartlett's essay is an alert. Watch out for this conservative who has a bad attitude on lots of things and opposes our new pronoun gender identity group project and our promotion of the grievance status of the newly formed sex gender dysmorphist deviant group. Wow. After I wrote to others about my discovery of Peterson, I was directed by one reader to a recent Peterson media splash, a YouTube interview come debate by a feminist firebrand, Kathy Newman, on Britain's Channel 4, which I did watch that video and chuckled through most of it. Ms. Newman, Ms. whoever came up with that shit, someone needs to smack them, a veteran UK TV personality engaged Dr. Peterson on her claim that unequal female pay and power in business and other organizations are an example of gender persecution and oppression by the patriarchal Western societies. Miss Newman came, all armed up, shouting her flinty-edged argument that gender job inequalities are due to bias and abuse by men. Then came a well-deserved Peterson social sciences buzzsaw refuting her arguments, delivered with a smile to the visibly frustrated and increasingly desperate Newman, who seemed relieved when the 30-minute interview ended. Peterson, to the delight of millions of people who watched the video, and it is nearing 4 million views, 150,000 likes, and 3 some thousand dislikes. And it was well prepared and a skilled matador with Newman, gently, politely, reminding her that sex is not the only thing to consider when there are male female differences. Peterson took Newman's arguments in mid-flight and decimated her attack. Didn't miss opportunities to point out her in, in ter, interrogatory, is that how you say that? Misconduct. And it was a rout. Highlighting his rhetorical skills, command of the social science research literature, good sense, and overarching good humor. There was a particularly good segment where Peterson reminded Newman that her accusations and assertions are based on an incorrect and unscientific univariant or one cause analysis of blaming sex when good social science research requires a multivariant or multiple causes analysis. He followed up with examples of many alternative causes for inequities and inequalities, simple things like choice, preferences, conflicts of personal and social responsibilities, female fertility time frames, emotional constitution, physical energy realities, required time commitments, and domestic and family priorities, 
and he pointed out that the um, the variates list was incomplete. Game set match to Peterson. Peterson's expertise as a debater and interviewee is not the place to stop this discussion. His great accomplishments is teaching, counseling, and coaching people to urge them to live the good life, the virtuous life. He has an impressive social media following consistent with his success as a revered and respected classroom teacher everywhere he taught. Combined with a successful general clinical practice that has a special effort devoted to career and life coaching. Peterson teaches people to be better, stronger, faster, and more competent and respected, including women looking for tips and coaching on how to succeed. Coaching is his deal, his nature, his forte. And you can see his intensity when he does intimate videos with just him up close to the camera with a look that reminded me of Vince Lombardi, which I don't know that it reminds me of that, but hey. Peterson is a compelling, f or Peterson is as compelling filling up a camera as he is wandering the classroom, appearing to be improvising on the theme but doing it as musicians do a cadenza, jazz artists, and improvisation. The trick to jazz improvisation is playing music on a theme that repeats with the disciplined creativity that furthers the theme. Peterson has his game in order. No lulls or empty places. A stay awake lecturer. Well aware of the theme. Effective because he is insightful and eloquent, but committed to teach and modest in his attitude. Peterson's got it and ain't gonna lose it. The only he way he might be ambushed is being targeted by the destroyers of the left with their name-calling and politics of personal destruction, because it's so much easier for them to slur and slander than to rebuke and rebuff with facts. I never underestimate the people shredder political correctness crowd, which has vile and vicious tactics down to an art form. I'm reminded of the old saying that faculty politics is so bloody because the stakes are so small. And Peterson has a lot of natural and dedicated academic enemies. Take a look at his website and his various lists of rules for good living, and you get a picture. He's a classical Stoic, and he advises people on how to grow up and be adults with a mature and virtuous approach to life. He says honesty is the key to civil behavior and courage and fortitude are essential. People on our side of the cultural divide would have to agree with damn near everything he says. Peterson objects to identity politic, politics as the product of socialist cant and ideology that wants to put people in groups based on grievance or the socialist theory of deterministic societal struggle. He considers socialism misanthropic at its core, dead to the importance of the individual. He opposes the socialist mindset that is nihilistic about the value and importance of the human spirit and human action and conduct that subscribe to a moral code. That's a mouthful, but necessary to be fully indicative of his superior intellect and good instincts about what is good, what is right. Peterson is a traditionalist. He's committed to teaching people to live a virtuous life. And he thinks happiness is living the virtuous life. Pursuit of happiness is his theme. How to be your best friend in achieving real happiness and he adheres to the Aristot Aristotelian Stoic Buddhist American philosophy 
that being a virtuous, honest, courageous, engaged adult, a credit to society, and to your friends and family is the way to achieve happiness. Peterson has staked out his position and is at war with totalitarians and ideologues of the left, in academia and society, and, in general, as an old-fashioned stoic. He's a fearsome sight for a leftist. Peterson has written and lectured about rules for a good life, 10 rules, 12 rules, and a longer set of 40 rules for life that are discussed in his YouTube videos and other media, including books. Some rules are mother wit, common sense reminders for the needy. Some are just wisdom, essential to a good and happy life. The label alt-right is used as a weapon against Peterson because it is an all-encompassing epithet, a flexible way to condemn anyone with a conservative lean. It is being used now by critics of Peterson to describe him, since his teachings um, from a conservative point of view and his enemies would be happy to label him uh, misogynist, racist, homophobe, dysmoph dysmorphorpic, what the hell, transgender forpic, phobic, a moralist, intolerant bigot who must be destroyed. Oh, you big babies. Stoics know these things. Marcus Aurelius said, when you wake up in the morning, tell yourself, the people I deal with today will be meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous, and surly. They are like this because they can't tell good from evil. But I have seen the beauty of good and the ugliness of evil and have recognized that the wrongdoer has a nature related to my own, not of the same blood and birth, but of the same mind and possessing a share of the divine. And so none of them can hurt me. Took a few days to absorb Peterson, a bright and fascinating phenomenon, an articulate, smart, eloquent man doing some public counseling as a lecturer in a classroom on a video, talking or taking on politically correct tyrants on the side. I've read his rules for a good life, listened to his commentaries on the rules, and it became evident that Peterson who grew up in a remote, very cold Fairview, Alberta, north and west of Edmonton, and went on to great success in academia and as a psychologist in practice and then a public psychologist and teacher, exemplifies an old but important story. His life course appears to be the story of a human searching for meaning, wisdom, and purpose. The Buddhist Nobel Eighth, Eightfold Path, Taoist and Confucian philosophy, Christian concepts of wisdom and virtue, the Roman and Greek Stoic meditations of Marcus Aurelius, and the teachings of the Greek slave Stoic Doyen Epictetus. Is that how you say that? Hmm. One thing Peterson has done is awaken a young audience predominantly male, to the value of the virtuous life, the life of a responsible, engaged, and effective adult male or female who is a credit and an asset, a benefit for friends and family. And that's good news. The bad news is that the academy and the chattering class are opposed to such teachings as promoting values of the evil and oppressive Western tradition. That's from John Dale Brown, MD, JD. He is a physician or yeah, physician and inactive attorney living in Brownwood, Texas. Thank you ever so much. I have run out of time. Holy smokes. So 
Thank you all for listening in to the Rocket Chair this evening. I didn't cover a whole lot of and yet I still covered an awful lot of territory. So thanks everyone for listening in. Be sure to stick around because Grimmy and Moose Girl will be on later on this evening for the Freakers Ball. And uh, tomorrow I will be back with Flasher Rooney Dork for the Dork Table at noon Eastern Time. But until then, y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. Holy smokes. I just really <laughs> went off on a tangent, didn't I? So, um, I guess I will catch up with you later. But first, I got some rumblies in my tumbly, so I need to go and feed myself. So, <laughs>